वेलकम बैक टू द क्लास वेलकम बैक टू द क्लास सो वी वर लर्निंग अबाउट एवोल्यूशन इन द लास्ट क्लास एंड वी सो वॉट एवोल्यूशन इज हाउ अर्थ हैज एवॉल्ड एंड मे बी वी स्पोक अबाउट सम ऑफ द थियोरीज दैट सेट अबाउट हाउ लाइफ वुड हैव ऑरिजिनेटेड एंड वी सेट दैट दिस सिंगल लाइफ फॉर्म underwent lots and lots of modifications it underwent lots and lots of changes it tried to adapt itself and based on darwin's theory it said that you know any organism which showed reproductive fitness any organism which showed the ability to outbreed the organism which had the ability to adapt itself now they had a better chance of survival now once we are through with all these things we try to correlate the geographical age and the biological evolution the geographical evolution and the biological evolution and of course we found a quite a strong relationship between the geographical evolution and the biological evolution and hence it was proved that every organism is trying to evolve itself and there is evolution which is a continuous process happening all the time because el- environment is changing now though we say all this you know it's not enough because we as scientists we would want an evidence so in this section we would uh, discuss on some of the factors uh, which deals with uh, the evidences for evolution okay uh, so talking about what are evidences and some of the evidences for evolution there are quite a uh, many there are quite a many and we see that evolution is not happening only for one particular organism or it's not even happening for one particular group of organisms in fact evolution is happening all the time at all the places okay so you take any part of the earth there is evolution happening you take any organism on this earth there is also evolution happening now this can be very well understood by the study of fossils you know what fossils are now fossils we have studied in your previous years these are the remains of the life forms okay found in rocks now what would happen is suppose there is an organism and due to some uh, natural calamity there is a layer of sand or layer of soil that is on the, you know living form it cannot undergo decomposition normally and under the high pressure high temperature you see that its print is seen on the sand that is covering it now this is what we call as the fossils uh, so we have this uh, what we do is we take the cross section of the earth's crust and when i take the cross section of the earth's crust there are so many layers okay one layer above that one more layer above that one more layer so there is one sediment arrangement of sediments on one over the other now lower the sediment it means long uh, time back there was this particular soil now there are layers and layers of soil that is present on the surface okay now whenever i do this kind of cross sectioning of the soil okay when i take the cross sectioning of the soil you see that there are different aged rock sediments okay there are different aged rock sediments now these different aged rock sediments 
if i take one particular sediment of that and try to kind of segregate that sediment something like you know you, you can imagine this like a sandwich suppose you have a sandwich you take out the upper layer then you see some of the vegetables you take out that layer then again you see the bread right and they take out that bread again you might see some more layers of vegetables so that way you have different aged rock segments try to take out each of these aged rock segments and there you can see various uh, you know fossils and these fossils are different uh, you know if i say they are the different life forms they might not be exactly like how we are but if you just look at it it might look like an organism it can look like an animal it can look like a plant and these plants are slightly different from what we see right now and now i know that because they are different aged rock sediments i can very clearly say that those are the animals or the plants that were present during that presence of rock on the earth so like this just by looking at the rock and just by studying the fossils that are seen in that particular rock sediment i can make lots and lots of conclusion the first conclusion that i can make is whether that organism is really present at that time the second one is later trying to study the fossils in detail and then try to find out which organs are similar which organs are different or there is some kind of relationship between the fossil organism and the present organism so all these various studies can be shown okay now this study is what we call as archaeology where we try to study the various rock sediments various types of fossils and we also try to see if those fossils uh, have some kind of resemblance between the existing human or existing animal or the plant population with that of that time okay now one thing that you should always remember is that once you are trying to find out and study the fossils what is very important for us is something that we call as the geological geological time span what exactly is geological time span now if you just look at the core of the earth okay now this is the top surface now if you just look here you can see that there are various layers now each layer is formed newly because every time there is weathering of rocks every time there is soil new soil that is formed now you should know that this soil was the top soil some years back this was the top soil many thousands of years back and this was the top soil many many years ago so this way if you just try to find out the geological time span it is easier for us to calculate at what geological time span did uh, the organism we found in this particular fossil is present in fact just to give you an example here uh i'm sure you know the study of dinosaurs so dinosaurs were present long time back they are extinct now okay now what we do is we try to study about these dinosaurs there are various fossils available i'll be telling you more about it so you try to see at which uh, layer is the fossil of the dinosaurs found and then you will kind of conclude that in this particular area this particular dinosaur was present so that way it is very easy for us to kind of link the organism be it extinct or be it present and we will also try to get the geological time span now you might think how exactly do we get to know the real age of these fossils or even for that matter the rock now this is done by something that we call as c14 
radioactive dating. Now we all of us know that carbon is one very very important part of our uh, any living organism, right? Now we have very small amounts of carbon 14 as well and we try to find out uh, the age by doing one technique which is called as radioactive dating. Okay, so this is one particular aspect of studying fossils. But then we do not just stop at this. Okay, uh, one second. Yeah, uh, just to give you an example of, uh, of fossils. Okay, we have this diagram. You see that this is the life span. Okay, this is the lifespan or the life uh, era that we can call off. Okay, this is basically a group of dinosaurs here. Maybe I can erase slight part of this and write their names. Okay, uh, so we have right now certain reptiles. Uh, for me, if I think of any dinosaur, I would just think it as a huge. Uh, lizard okay so we have huge lizard can be a crocodile so we can compare a dinosaur with a crocodile you just look at this here there is one which is called as brachiosaurus now this is one particular dinosaur which is here now you see that there is uh, this was a this particular geological uh, time span and then you saw that there is one more which is called as stegosaurus there is stegosaurus and somehow you see that uh, from this there was the first bird if i can call it as a bird or the first reptile that is uh, giving us to the present reptiles that was formed which is archaeopteryx Okay, and from Archaeopteryx, you see crocodiles and you also see birds. Okay, now from Stegosaurus, you see one more particular, uh, particular uh, organism here. This is, uh, this is also a dinosaur. Any idea what it is called as? Uh, okay, now this is called as Triceratops. triceratops then we have uh, crocodiles and then we have the birds and then from there there was one more flying uh, flying flying uh, dinosaur any idea where it, what is it called as this was uh, shown widely in some of the movies uh, which is called as pteranodon pteranodon was the flying dinosaur okay and then from Brachiosaur, Brachiosaurus, we see the T-Rex or Tyrannosaurus. Okay. Now, how did we get all this? The, all this study was done by the study of fossils. So, we take the fossils, we try to find out at what geological time span they lived. And then, based on that, we kind of get to know from which area, which lifespan geological lifespan this particular organism existed so that is the study of fossils but many times only fossils do not help carbon dating also does not help but a kind of comparison between the present organism and the organisms of various fossils will help us a lot okay now that is what we call as the comparative biology comparative we call this as the comparative biology so what exactly is comparative biology now here we are going to check for two important studies and what is that two important study is the study about anatomy and then 
we also study about the morphology you know what is anatomy anatomy is something that is inside okay so the presence of the arrangement of bones uh, what kind of joints are there that would be the study of anatomy and morphology is something that is you are seeing it gives you a structure that study is what we call as the morphology okay so we do something called as the comparative biology so what am i trying to find out is what kind of structure it has inside and outside and then i am trying to go and study about going to study about similarities and differences okay now which organisms am i trying to find out now these organisms can be between two fossil organisms something like the one which was shown to you just now may be from say archaeopteryx and tenorodon or i can go for brachiosaurus and t-rex i'll try to find out how much of similarities they have how much of differences they have this is what something that can be done everything based on the fossil study or maybe what i can also do is i can also try to con kind of compare between say a uh, t-rex and the present lizard there will be some kind of similarities there will also be some kind of differences and we try to find out what are the similarities and what are the differences now why this study is important is because from all these studies we will try to find out if they have any common ancestor if they have any common ancestor now generally you see that there is some kind of common ancestor that is present for some organisms so for example if you just look at a lizard a crocodile don't you see some similarities yes they have a common ancestor and uh, you might be wondering that most of the mammals we all of us have a uh, same or not same uh, we all share, we all of us share a common ancestor in fact uh, i have told this maybe in several other classes last year that you know our immune system and a mice immune system is around 99.97% similar now that's a huge number that's lot of similarities all that is mainly because we share a common ancestors now that's 3% 0.3% uh, difference comes because finally over a period of time my body structure changed some of the metabolic activities are different whereas the rat developed its own metabolic activities and structure now that gave rise to 0.3% of difference otherwise you see there are lot of similarities uh, at the genetic level as well as as well as at the cellular level now when i said cellular level and the genetic level you cannot find out the genetic level or the cellular level for say t-rex why because now you don't get t-rex blood to analyze therefore what is it that i should do now for that what we do is we do not study about the blood the cells at the dna patterns but we study about some kind of the arrangement of the anatomy and the morphological aspects and they are called as homologous organs we call that as homologous organs now in the case of homologous organs you try to find out if they have any kind of similar pattern or similar function in animals okay so uh, there might be lots of patterns that way available okay uh, just to give you one example here so on the top we have one particular a structure one is which is a thorn the other one is a kind of a creeper okay the tendrils thorns and the tendrils now this is bougainvillea and cucurbita okay now you please look at the places of its origin you see that the places of its origin 
he is very much same okay and uh, you see that uh, the structure is the same the origin is same and my, sometimes you also see that their functions might be the same now such organs are what we call as or what we call as the homologous organs i want to give one more example which is very much similar to our understanding so here we have uh, man cheetah whale and bat if you just notice the pattern here all these are mammals do you all agree with this they have a nice well developed spinal cord they have notochord and they are all mammals right now if we just look at their four limbs four limbs is like we have hands the cheetah has four limbs the whale has a uh, whale and a bat they have their own organs here if i just look at the four limbs all of these organisms have a similar anatomical structure in the sense if i just try to find out how their structure is you see they have one two here one and two then you have one and then two here one and two so the structure at the anatomical level is the same okay so to be very precise this is called as humerus then the radius then the ulna then this are, these are called as the metacarpals and then finally we have the phalanges all of them are present in a very very similar fashion man cheetah whale and the bat okay so structurally they are similar but just look at their functions now if by chance i have this kind of structure which is of a bat do you think i will be able to write on the board highly impossible and suppose our whale had a human limb here though they are structurally similar please note that if by chance this goes to whale it cannot survive in water it cannot swim right therefore what you see is though each one of them are are structurally similar the way they are uh, adapted to carry out its function is completely different in the case of humans the four limbs are adapted to hold something to grab something and to give support okay uh, so these are the functions of the four limbs here whereas in the case of cheetah it help it has wonderful muscular ability there its structure helps to kind of contract and relax faster and hence they can run faster the structure of the bones in the whale they help them to swim and survive better in water and similarly the bats four limbs help them to fly so they all of them have same structure but each one of them developed slightly differently based on the needs of the organism bat had to fly whale had to be in water and you see that the way they develop is slightly different now this kind of development or this kind of i uh, sorry this kind of organs where the structure is same but the functions are different we call that as homologous organs and if we see any kind of homologous organs it clearly means that they have a common ancestor they have a common ancestor okay now please note that maybe long time back when i say long time back i am telling you about many many millions of years ago so many years ago maybe we had one single ancestor and that single ancestor some of them tried to give rise to man some of them became cheetah over a period of time some of them became whale and some of them bat so one one single ancestor gave rise to many groups of organism now this kind of evolution is what we call as divergent evolution what do we call this as we call this as the divergent evolution okay so 
divergent evolution basically tells us that there was a common ancestor and at some point of time based on the needs the single structure was developing differently to give a different organism so that is what we call as the divergent evolution okay but not necessarily all the time many times you see that there are some organs when we look under the uh, when we look under the uh, fossils we see not the homologous organs but we see something called as the analogous organs now what are these analogous organs now here here you do not see any structural similarity okay there is no structure there is no structural similarity at all but you see there is some kind of same function function is similar okay what do we call that for example uh, have you seen any bird you know that all the birds fly and uh, they have feathers right so you have seen birds flying have you seen a butterfly flying i am sure you would laugh at me for asking this question butterfly also flies yes now both of them fly and if you just look at the wings of butterfly and uh, uh, birds they are not the same anatomically even morphologically you see that they are not the same they might uh, perform similar functions but structurally they are different now such structures are what we call as the analogous organs okay now in the case of analogous organs you see that they are structurally different but somehow the functions are related and this is what we call as we call as the convergent evolution okay convergent evolution because two different structures performing the same function to have similar kind of evolution is what we call as convergent evolution okay just to give you one more example here have you seen the eye of an octopus i know it would not be that great but the eye of an octopus and the eyes of mammals they show analogous they are analogous organs they are born somewhere structurally completely indifferent but both of them are helping to see right that is one example and, simi and similarly we have flippers of penguins and flippers of dolphins okay uh, maybe that is because of some kind of some kind of i would say adaptation because these organisms penguins dolphins uh eyes of octopus mammals all this they was given that evolution was giving rise to the same function and this resultant in this resulted in the convergent evolution okay so this way when we are talking about evolution we have comparative biology as the second group which helps us to find out the pattern or helps us to find out the pattern of evolution and also act as a proof for evolution one is to find out the similarities the other one is to find out the differences between two organisms and based on that we can get to know if there is any convergent variation or convergent evolution or whether there is a divergent evolution okay but you know what we do not stop it at this many times we argue going at the molecular level trying to find out if there is any similarity in proteins and in genes okay so there are proteins and there are genes so uh, is the are the proteins but this again we cannot go back to the fossil study but yes for all the organisms for doing comparison comparative biology what we do is we compare the proteins of say humans and some other mammal in fact this was also one of the reason uh, how we can use insulin of pigs 
for treating diabetes of course right now we do not use that long time back we used to treat diabetes by giving insulin taken from pig that is because we see that there is similarities of proteins hormones like insulin in humans as well as pigs similarly we have lot of similarities and also a few differences between the genes of the organisms so some of the genes that we have are also seen in other organisms they might perform the same function or they might not perform the same function but yes you have most of the genes present even in all the other organisms okay and in fact study of this uh, anatomy and morphological feature we do not stop it at that we compare even the protein and the genes of an organism now that would be the biochemical studies now this biochemical studies you know we can very easily find out how much of ancestry is being shared between us and some other organism like how i said our immune system is 97% similar to rats or mice so we can try to find out how much what percentage of similarities is seen between us and the other organism and then we also try to find out how different we are as well how diverse the organisms are so this is one more evidence for studying about uh, evolution happening at, as a continuous process and happening throughout okay but uh, then you should know that man started with a process of agriculture okay he started agriculture he started horticulture then he started with the growing plants flowering plants to domesticated many animals domesticated crops and so much of breeding program was carried out okay uh, if you talk about dogs dogs and wolves were very close but then we kind of bred a dog to that extent that now dog does not know that it has come from wolf and the basic characteristics itself are very much different right so you see that by continuous breeding and continuous modification of some of the genes which i think only humans have done we have come up with new breeds we have come up with new species and also some of the new organisms and again please let us know that this has not happened in one generation this has taken millions and millions of years at the same time okay so earlier we took wolf we started to breed them and now they became dogs that's called that's the kind of point that i would like to make here right so that is uh, about uh, the human environment in selecting few breeds okay now uh, there was one study that was done to kind of tell that evolution is always happening and evolution is completely dependent on uh, our environment you change the environment you see that the organisms also change and how exactly does that happen okay so there had to be some kind of studies that was done so to talk about that i would erase all this and talk about one particular proof for showing that evolution indeed is happening so this is particularly a picture of a moth okay we call that as a winged moth which is called as the winged moth uh, this is uh, basically uh, you know a study that was done long time back sometime during 1850s you remember 1850s were the year when there was lots and lots of studies that were going on there was industrial industrial revolution that started right so at that time there was study of moths that were carried out by few scientists naturalists so at that time they observed 
that there was lot of white winged moths okay there was lot of there was lot of white winged moths and these white winged moths they would be present on the trees obviously and uh, this would be very easily be spotted okay whether the white winged moths were present on a lighter tree or a darker tree they could be easily spotted okay uh, and at that time there were more of white winged moths on the trees okay now almost at the same time uh, not same time say after few years so in the year in 1920s when the industrialization had just begun and maybe after 10 to 15 years they observed that the number of white winged moths had drastically come down and the dark winged moths were present okay the dark winged moths were present in the same area so uh, initially there were say let me say there were around uh, uh, white winged moths would be 100 dark winged moths would be one or two but later in 1920s 1920s 100 were dark and very very few of them were white winged moths you can say that the proportion was reversed okay this reversal of proportion is something which is very very important in evolution and even in uh, the understanding of uh, the effect of genes which maybe we will discuss when we are discussing hardy weinberg law anyway so you could see that there is a the proportion that was reversed and then people thought why this proportion got reversed okay now as usual there were many theories that were put uh, forth and some of them which was accepted by many people was that you know there are lot of predators okay the predators can be any insect that eats this moth so the predators will spot a moth and which is the first moth that you could see here it is always the white one okay so the white moth is something that is easily seen and easily eaten by the predators whereas a kind of the brown or the dark colored moth is something that is this is something that is kind of camouflaged okay please note that even during 1920s uh, the tree trunks became comparatively darker you see the tree trunk here this is light brown and here it is dark brown the tree trunks also became quite dark why because there was lot of release of smoke and soot and this got under the lenticels and the bark and the entire tree looked darker now at this time the white winged moth just could not survive because they were easily spotted and they were eaten whereas the dark winged moth uh, the dark winged moth is also called as a melanized moth now that was surviving you get the point so long time back when there was no industrialization even then white one was the first to be seen that that should be the argument right now that was not uh, so important because at that time when the forest was thick there was uh, this lichens that were growing on the trees okay now in the presence of lichens lichens grow i'm sure you know that when there is no pollution so when there was lichens growing this moths and the lichens looked very much alike and it kind of confused the predators yes and when the predators were confused you see that their number was still surviving but the industrialization made the wood or the tree trunk darker it also made the lichens to just vanish and because of these reasons these reasons you could see that the white moths were easily seen and spotted by the predators and over a very short period of time see in the scale of evolution 1850 to 1920 is just like you know a wink of an eye so very very small time in that area in in that short period of time you see that the white moth just disappeared okay so this way you see how the 
environment plays a very important role to kind of select which organism to be present okay uh, so all this just tells us that there are lots and lots of adaptations by the organism by the plant system and also by the environment for the organisms that are present right uh, just to add one more point here just to add one more point here we use lot of herbicides we use lot of pesticides and frankly speaking uh, all this has resulted in a kind of resistant variety of plants resistant variety of animals and i don't know how much we are resistant to because that's something which i cannot argue this at this point of time uh, i still remember if we had water that was present unattended mosquitoes would breed you just take a handful of ddt and you put it on that you could see that the mosquitoes would not breed there okay but now you see that even if you spray a lot of ddt in the water there is still mosquitoes which grow in that water and they are all mosquitoes which are resistant varieties okay this is just one example but there are so many herbicides and pesticides for which many insects many pests many herbs we are all becoming kind of quite resistant okay and there are so many microorganisms which have become resistant to antibiotics because we take antibiotics okay and if the continuous usage of these antibiotics has let them let those are microorganisms to develop resistance so in spite of me taking antibiotics it's not sure that the microorganisms are killed so similarly we have a resistant organisms of you know that appears every now and then which happens not in case of uh, thousands of years or millions of years as we talk it is only in few years and this is because this is because those organisms those microorganisms or any other small organisms they reproduce very fast and they have a better adaptability okay therefore you cannot say that evolution is always one way we can never say that evolution is a continuous process it's not a direct process it's not always happening in a positive way we do not know how that happens but yes you see that it is a process which happens because of various chance events that happens in nature and also mutations play a very very important role okay you change the environment you are changing or you are giving that organism to adapt itself better and it can adapt itself better by various methods it can go for simple mutation or it might go for a complex mechanism change in their metabolism or it can be anything else or you know all this mutations all this changes is something that is quite unpredictable but in spite of it we do of course predict how our nature is how we are going to be after thousands of years so these are some of the evidences to prove that evolution is happening and it is not a one day process it is continuously happening okay now with all this understanding of how we study about evolution how we study uh, uh, the homologous the convergent or the divergent uh, you know evolution and all that now we need to study about one more very very interesting concept which is called as adaptive radiation okay we are supposed to study about two important evolutions rather one is called as something that we call as adaptive evolution uh, uh, which uh, we say uh, it's a kind of uh, we call it as uh, adaptive radiation okay uh, the other one is something that we call as the biological evolution so we try to find out what is adaptive what is uh, this uh, biological evolution in our next class so i hope at this point of time you have uh, realized and you know what exactly is evolution some of the major types of evolution the convergent and the divergent and then you also know about 
uh, how exactly you can decipher a common ancestor okay so we after studying about all this we need to study about the next part which we would do in our next class so i hope you have understood all this any doubts make a note of it we will surely discuss about all of these in our next class so uh, please read the textbook because uh, that is something which is a base for uh, you to kind of grasp the subject and then uh, if you have any doubts make a note of it we will discuss in our live class see you till then bye